Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're, we're spread wide and far, I think, this afternoon. Tim Reed from Health Action International, and thank you for joining us for this exciting Knowledge Ecology International event to appraise progress of WHO's COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, or CTAP, as we call it. This session was originally billed as a side event in the margins of WIPO, but judging by the response, I think interest in CTAP is actually makes it firmly front and center. So I have to do some housekeeping first. Um, I don't have to tell you where the emergency exits and refreshments are, which is usually my job at a side event, but um, you have all been muted and that's the way it's going to stay. Unless, of course, you're a speaker uh, or we call upon you to, to speak. So questions can be put in the chat box um, and Thuru is going to pick those up and pass them forward. So uh, that's in the chat function. And to our wonderful panel, you have about seven minutes. I won't introduce you um, because you can do a better job of introducing yourselves for, so for the sake of time. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll just go straight to it. And Marianne Jella, I know that you have limited time with us, so I'd like to ask you to take the floor first. I'll give you the heads up at about six minutes, and away you go. Thank you, Marianne Jella. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim. Thank PEI for the invite, and let me say, Tim, it's a pleasure to see you, because this week, uh, AJI, working with WHO, we are having an insulin workshop which is a very much a very important event. We have this in the entire week, it also virtually, like we're doing everything else. So, but uh, AJI was a big supporter on the on on this uh, on the access to insulin, and I thank you for the push. Uh, so that, let me start because we 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 are talking at a WIPO event, a side event, right? So let me just remind everybody that we recently, two months ago, we, we launched the, the second edition of the trilateral study on access to medical technologies and innovation, which is a trilateral, means WHO, WIPO, and WTO, where we seek to strengthen the understanding of the interplay between health, trade, and IP, and how they affect innovation and access to medical technologies. And this second edition also brings some practical lessons from experience on the intersections between health, IP, and trade within the broader perspectives of the SDGs. And this is very important because this study also, due to the circumstances you share, includes an insert on COVID-19 that shows how important these interlinkages between health, IP, and trade are. And you can see there how countries in different stakeholders are reacting to the pandemic. So please look for the studies called uh, Trilateral Study on Access to Medical Technologies and Innovation. It's available online. And in the context of this pandemic and the reason we are all in this panel, let me outline a little bit what's going on with the COVID technology access pool, which we well, first we called it Costa Rica proposal, and then it became the CTAP. It was the Costa Rica proposal because it was first proposed by the president of Costa Rica and was joined at the launch uh, with WHO by more than 40 countries during the solidarity call to action late in May. And <coughs> some of the partners here were the intellectual fathers and mothers of this idea. So it's very good that we are having this conversation today. Because while we recognize the important role that patents play in fueling innovation, this is a time when people must take priorities and, and punish. <coughs> and we are in a situation, this pandemic, where health technology, any health technology that proves to be safe and effective against this SARS-CoV-2 is bound to be what we call a global public good, right? Which means they should be affordable and accessible in all countries. And it's a very different context where on one hand you have a, it's a different context in many aspects, not only because of the socioeconomic impact, but also because you have a, it's not anymore an issue of lower middle income countries and high income countries. We are talking about small markets and, and large markets, big markets. We're talking about <coughs> uh, low-income countries that have manufacturing capacity 
in high income countries that are small and have no manufacturing capacity. So the, the powers at play are very different during this pandemic. I think we need to use, and the idea is that we use this to the best advantage to, uh, to make sure that whatever products come out are a global public health goods and that they are available. Because on one hand, we also do have an uh, unprecedented allocation of public resources. On the other hand, we are speeding up the R&D processes. And there is an understanding that we need global solutions and that no nation can, no country can sor sort this out on their own. Although, of course, we are seeing with uh, the, this nationalism coming up uh, in one another country on a very strong basis. Uh, with uh, the reservations on not on, on therapeutics, but also on vaccines. Uh, let me say that the CTAP is a very ambitious con construct and WHO is very grateful for the partners who have been pushing this agenda forward because there's still a lot of mis misinformation out there about CTAP. Right? Let me say that it's a voluntary mechanism that works in the framework. I'm, I'm gonna highlight some of the, the, the parts. One, it works in the framework of the patent system, pulling patents to expand access to treatment, treatments for, for all. It's not about creating new structures, but using existing structures like the medicine patent. Uh, through CTAP, we are inviting, we'll be inviting companies and governments that develop an effect therapeutic diagnostic of, of vaccine to share their knowledge IP and data through mechanisms that promote public health driven licensing, such like I mentioned, the medicines pattern pool or the UN backed technology access partnership, which is the UNDP with the UN Development Bank, which could then sub license the patent to generic manufacturers and support technology transfer to them. But the TAP, the technology access partnership, we are spending a lot of time with them. But it's, false, it's to foster local production and technology transfer, and it's one of the founding partners of the, of the CETA. The other aspect that's super important is that the sharing of data and information, which is normally kept secret and protected either by IP or by, by other researchers who want to publish. This information could materially advance the speed at which technologies are developed and avoid, for example, the repetition of duplication of research carried out by others. And here we are talking about WHO's Global Observatory on Health and other mechanisms, and also, for example, the interactions that we can have with G8, who's already, a, a, you know, it's a genomic the, the sequencing uh, partner, right? So uh, making the know-how associated with the new technologies available in wide license around the world would shorten the time to make them available as soon as possible to those who need it. But we, where are we now? Like I'm saying, this is quite complex and the, the timelines, some of the timelines when you're talking, for example, about creating capacity or tech transfer, they are need to longer term time, right? So where we are right now, we have established the CTAP steering committee with international partners, including the government of Costa Rica. We have developed a concept note on how the, what, what's the role, how this, this partnership, how the CTAP will function. And we are developing a strategy for private sector engagement. And we just had a discussion on this strategy today with uh, the steering committees. So what will be the next steps? We'll have a UNGA, a General Assembly, you know the General Assembly is happening starting this week. There will be a side event on the 25th that's co-hosted by Costa Rica and, and uh, NWHO. It's at 16 hours Geneva time. Uh, we, we are preparing a, a briefing session for the founding member states for late October as well uh, a consultation process on the private uh, sector engagement with external partners. So the idea is to increase awareness and, and, and develop very operational modes to make this work in, for the short term, what are the things that can be achieved in short term and what are the gains that we can get for mid and long term. I'll stop here and, and I think I, I didn't overrun my time. Thank you.
It was perfect timing, Mariangela. Um, you, you have to leave in about 20 minutes, is that right? You're muted, but I'm getting a nod. Okay, so I know to come back to you just to, for, for a closing remark. No, I can stay until seven. I can, I can, oh, okay. see, I can okay. stay until Thank seven. You. Super. Okay. okay, it's now my pleasure to invite Anna Marriott from Oxfam to the floor. Uh, Anna, don't forget to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. And um, just a big thank you for welcoming me to this event. It's a pleasure to, to speak um, on such an important topic. Um, so I know time is brief, so I will try and be brief. Um, I should start by saying that Oxfam is a huge supporter of CTAP. Um, we think it's a vital initiative in accelerating access to successful therapeutics, diagnostics and, and vaccines. Um, we want the World Health Organization to champion it even more. And of course, we urgently need more countries um, to be championing it um, in addition to, to those that already do, um, which we strongly support. Um, Oxfam is also very clear, as we all are, that we are in an unprecedented crisis and that there can be no room for compromise, no room for business as usual, no time for ideology um, and no, no room for putting private interests and profit before public health um, and the goal of maximising supply and access to any future vaccine or effective therapeutics and, and diagnostics, as well as PPE, of course. At Oxfam, we focus the majority of our efforts to date on trying to secure universal and equitable access to a future vaccine. Um, and we have joined with others calling for a people's vaccine and we formed an alliance with others um, calling for a people's vaccine, a vaccine that is free of intellectual property barriers um, that's at a transparent, low affordable cost. And we're calling on both governments and pharmaceutical companies to openly share their intellectual property, their know-how, their data, um, and share their technology with CTAP um, so that we can maximize both supply and, and access. And I want to turn just briefly to, to some recent analysis of data that we have um, conducted to try and illustrate why we are calling for those things. So we've analysed available data on the leading vaccine candidates. There are nine candidates um, currently in phase three trials and of these supply information is um, publicly available only for five of those. So, the, so our analysis is focused on, on those five. For these five candidates, we've looked at the supply deals and we find that a handful of rich countries representing just 13% of the global pop population have already bought up over half of the pro future promised supply of these vaccines. These countries include the UK, the US, the EU member states and Japan amongst others. But perhaps even more relevant in relation to the CTAP is that we added up the total reported production capacity of all five of these candidates and found that on current projections, even together, they could only supply only a third of the global population. And remember that's on the basis that all five of them are successful, which we know is, is potentially very unlikely. So we could be seeing even more people left out. So what we have is, to smaller pie and a pie that is being largely eaten up by rich countries. And I've heard some leading influential people within the ACT Accelerator, within COVAX, suggest that IP patents are not a problem in this case, in this vaccine. And I just think looking at the path that we're on and the supply constraints that we're seeing, I just simply cannot agree with that, that position. And as long as we're allowing private monopolies on any, any element of the vaccine, whether it's its formula, its ingredients, its production, the know-how, the technology, we risk continue traveling down that path where the majority of pharmaceutical companies will only strike deals um, with the highest bidder 
and supply will continue to be artificially limited by the manufacturing capacity of those single companies. Again, to illustrate my point today, the UK has secured five vaccine doses per capita. The 92 countries that belong to the advanced market commitment that's part of the COVAX facility currently have only secured the equivalent of one dose per seven people. And that's just for one vaccine, um, which may or may not be successful. So I'll, I'll stop there. I hope that case, that um, example, our analysis has illustrated why we've been calling for a people's vaccine and why we think CTAP is so incredibly important both to, to maximise supply and ensure fair access, as well as low prices um, for any future vaccine going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Um, so now um, it's my pleasure to invite Jamie. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? I think. Yep. Good. Well, uh, it, it, I would like to start by saying that um, from our point of view, uh, the, the, the CTAP, the, the, the COVID technology access pool has been too low profile at the WHO and in, in the world community. Most people have not really heard about it since its initial conversation about whether there should be a pool. And it, most of the discussion has really been on the focus of things like COVAX or things that focus on the products or the actions of groups like CEPI. So I think that one of the areas of frustration we have is that this has not really gotten as much attention, as much focus. I think that the people's vaccine effort is, is a really important initiative that uh, uh, UNAIDS and Oxfam and groups like that have really been advocating and, 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 and really deserves as much support as possible. But one, one thing that uh, both for the people, both for the people's vaccines and for the CTAP, we think it's important to emphasize the distinction between products on the one hand and know-how and IP on the other. We expect that there will be unfairness and rationing of the products initially. I mean, we don't really like that, but we, we just sort of expect that to happen. There's going to be fewer products available when a vaccine is available than there will be people that, that need it. We don't think that it's necessary to have shortages of know-how or the IP. Hoarding the intellectual property or hoarding the know-how in terms of making a vaccine is really, we think, indefensible. It's one thing to say that if Germany, for example, finances a vaccine effort that's successful, or the UK or the United States government or someone, that they may, or whether it's it, it could be Italy, it could be it could be uh, Russia, or it could be China, that they may want to have a larger proportion of the products go to their own population than their percentage of the world population. We, we sort of expect that to happen. But there's really no reason why the know-how in, in terms of how to manufacture a vaccine or a therapeutic is not shared widely and it should be shared widely in a pandemic. And not only that, it should be shared early and the type of sharing, the type of, uh, of know-how has to be a real serious technology transfer. It has to be, uh, uh, in addition to whatever the patent issues or the data rights are, it has to go down to the actual know-how and access to the cell lines. And they know how to do that. I mean, there's already within CEPI some agreements on vaccines for some manufacturing uh, capacity sharing. It's just not an open platform. And I think partly what's going on is some groups are really trying to do both in the industry side and their lobbying and some of the nonprofit funders are trying to preserve the idea that proprietary rights on vaccine technology is good public policy when we think it's really terrible policy in, in, in this area. Now, in terms of the CTAP, uh, one thing that we, we, we think should be, there should be more transparency about where it goes in terms of what it's doing. There, there are regular briefings on other things that are going on. There's public briefings about uh, the COVAX. There's co public briefings about uh, things that are happening in the therapeutics pill, pill, uh, pillar, but not enough on the CTAP. And there's not enough clear messaging that it's about the IP and the know-how as opposed to the product. So people don't really know even what it is. They don't know the difference, for example, between uh, the CTAP and the work that's being done um, on COVAX or in the therapeutics uh, pillar. So I think that that could be strengthened. 
Um, I noted that the initial proposal by Costa Rica included a role for the observatory. They, they, they ask in the initial letter that the Global Observatory on Health R&D create a database of R&D activity related to COVID, including estimates of the cost of clinical trials and the subsidies presented by governments and charities. Now that has not happened and it's unfortunate because in this pandemic, I think everyone has a stake in the outcome of these issues, whether you're infected or you're not infected, you're affected by it um, economically in terms of what's happened to the world economy. Everyone should know what's going on. And, and, and uh, I, I think that the narratives about how who's funding these, these, uh, these therapies and these vaccines uh, should be as transparent as possible. I think that the WHO has been rather slow to engage with the funders of R&D. The idea that you talk with the companies that own the IP, I think is a mistake. I think in the HIV example with the medicines patent pool, that's the path that was taken. And that was probably the most important path to be taken. Gilead was the first mover in that case of any sort of consequence in terms of having products that were important. And, and that strategy, I think, sort of in everyone's mind. But I think in this particular case, the role of the governments in funding the development and the purchasing is quite a bit different than it was for HIV. And we think that all the leverage is with the people funding the R&D, not the people, not the companies. And so we'd like to see a bigger emphasis. And we'd like to know more about what the WHO has done in engaging the funders. Um, uh, uh, we think there needs to be, it, 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 it should be the case that vaccines are clearly on the table and they shouldn't be deferring on the IP issues to the Gates Foundation or CEPI or COVAX or um, we think there needs to be a, a, a strategy to deal with uh, the Biden administration. If Biden wins, he might lose, he might win. But if he does win, he has committed to re-engage with the WHO. The Trump administration has shut down any conversation with the WHO at this point, although they may be open to working with some of the partners in CTEP like the medicines patent pool. But clearly, uh, the Biden administration might go in a completely different direction. And we'd like to hear more about, uh, our, well, I don't know what you can say right now, I mean, I'm a dip diplomatically appropriate, but clearly we think you should be trying to talk to the people in the Biden administration because if the US government would, would go all in on this, I think all the other countries would be in a position where there'd be a lot of pressure for them to follow. And then um, uh, uh, I think, you know, we've been disappointed not in, in the governments themselves. I don't want to blame the, the, the WHO too much because at the heads of state level, the initial messaging was that the vaccine should, or the whole approach to the, the whole approach to the uh, pandemic should be solidarity. It should be things like about uh, things being a public good. But the implementation has not gone that route. The implementation has been old school, proprietary, et cetera. I, I really apologize for, for delivering such sort of um, negative messaging on this, but I, 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 I do have to express some of the frustration we feel about where we stand right now in September 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, now I'd like to call on Lewis. Is Lewis, are you there? Yes, I am. That's super. Well, oh, that was Jamie's time up. Sorry about that. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I, I don't have too much time, so I, I'd like to start saying that uh, I'm also a fan of CTAP and I'm also I'm grateful of WHO for taking the leadership on this uh, unique opportunity to, to make prevail public interest and, and, and at the same time, you know, uh, test a new model for creating uh, and researching and producing uh, solutions on the health uh, uh, side. Uh, we believe that because of the high IP uh, component of this uh, project should have been WIPO, uh, but we, uh, we, and we think it's still time for WIPO also to join uh, WHO on this. Uh, saying that, that uh, we, we love CTAP, uh, as James Love had mentioned, we, uh, the, the fans of CTAP uh, feel a little bit frustrated. It's like we were waiting for, for the concert, you know, and we bought the tickets and we're ready to go. And, and, and still, you know, the, 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 uh, a minor band is playing. Uh, we, we, we haven't seen uh, actually CTAP uh, really to be delivering what it should be delivering. Uh, and I, I would like to, to highlight some things that uh, we feel that it might improve uh, 
the, the current status of CTAP. Uh, we see in, in, in the first place that there is uh, no specific or, or clear entities that should uh, foster and inform uh, public and stakeholders in each country a uh, part of CTAP. Uh, we believe or we see CTAP as, let, let's think, as a, a beautiful flower that it just uh, came up and, uh, and needs a gardener. And so, so we believe, and, and our call for WHO and those who are responsible for, for implementing in a global uh, sphere, is that to promote and each country should have a, a specific or, 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 or informed gardener that might you know, uh, take the leadership in that country. Uh, also, we believe that each research center or technology transfer office uh, should also have a, an appointed person responsible. Uh, and uh, what is uh, more important, we, we need to create a network of those uh, uh, gardeners, uh, that, that, as I call them, those uh, responsible for implementing CTAP around the world so we, we, we can really en engage all those people that uh, need the information. We have had the, the experience of universities who are interested on, uh, on, on participating in CTAP, but we, we don't have anyone to talk in the country or, or even uh, when we have call on WHO, we have seen that the, it, it's not very clear, you know, what uh, or to whom should we direct to. Uh, so we, we need, a, we have a need of, getting people responsible for this, uh, accountable for the implementation, but also we, we need to uh, work harder on the information on what is CTAP. Uh, we, we, we are very frustrated that still, you know, months from the, the time of uh, having CTAP uh, started, we, we, in WHO doesn't even have a, a web page in Spanish that explain what is CTAP. You only, if, if you go to, CTAP you will find it in English, but in any other language. We, we, that is really a, a complicated uh, problem for those who don't speak English. Also, we, we, we need, to, and we ask WHO to, to create a easy to find database with knowledge that will be available uh, through CTAP. So it's, it really becomes a relevant source of information. And to, to facilitate also uh, engagement of, uh, in, in, at a country level, we, we would like to see some guidelines from WHO uh, for the national responsible agencies on how to deal uh, with the commitments and, and to show them best practices on how to participate. And, and finally, what I think that is uh, the, the most critical problem is the issue of incentives. And, uh, and, uh, and I agree with James that the, the the problem is how to uh, get uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies and, and, and research centers to, to be willing to uh, contribute with their knowledge. And, uh, and, and, and a key element there is the linkage that has to have the funding from uh, government and, and the, the WHO initiatives to accelerate uh, research and, and development of uh, uh, vaccines or, or treatment is to make uh, the link of the obligation to, if you receive the funding, you should commit to CTAP. Also, I think it would, would be very important to have uh, or incentivate manda mandates from the participant government with relation to the public funded research to actually have a, a linkage to, uh, to CTAP. Also, uh, we, we think that we should explore uh, an alternative forms to uh, create incentive, M maybe, we, we should uh, think on that the, the knowledge that is presented on, on, on the CTAP database that we will have, that will be subject to copyleft. So, so we, we create an, 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 a chain of uh, new free knowledge based on what is available uh, through the CTAP pool. Uh, also, we, we might think that uh, to establish an obligation uh, that to make commitment to the pool before uh, a country or an, an agency might participate or take information from CTAP. I, and I want to stop here uh, before my time is uh, gone. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you. And so finally on the panel in this first sweep, uh, I invite Ellen to unmute. 
which is the same as step up to the microphone. <laughs> good, good evening, good, good morning, good afternoon. Um, wonderful to be here uh, with, with you all and to see so many people um, showing an interest in this issue. Uh, on the one hand, um, I, I, I do miss uh, coming to the WIPO General Assembly and meet all of you in person. But on the other hand, one of the, one of the good things that this corona crisis has brought us is our life on Zoom, where, which means that so many more people from so many different corners of the world can participate in these events. And that's a, that, that's a bonus. So I'm starting off on a, on a, on a positive note. Uh, it's downhill from here. Um, the, uh, the, in the, uh, the early days of the, uh, the, the corona crisis, um, uh, when people started to talk about the vaccines and countries came together and leaders organized meetings to uh, to get uh, the financing together to finance the, the research research and development that we, we heard a lot of a lot of good language uh, we still hear people say the, the vaccine should be a globe global public good there should be no monopolies we heard Emmanuel Macron with only a veiled reference to the Jonas Salk decision to maintain his polio vaccine in the public domain, uh, refer to it as this, no one should own this, uh, should own this vaccine. Um, the, so that, that, that started out promising. I think some of us thought, well, is this the crisis that will start turning things around a bit? At the same time, we saw billions of euros were raised to, uh, to start the financing of the research and development of new health technologies needed to uh, to tackle this uh, this pandemic and the, um, the the funding rally that the European Commission organized uh, that pledge stands today at 19 billion and these billions are today being spent they're 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 going they're going out of the door which is a very good thing uh, the WHO responded rapidly to the proposal by Costa Rica to establish the COVID-19 technology access pool. And I applaud them for that because I was one of the people involved in setting up the medicines patent pool. And that took us from the moment of proposal to it actually happening 10 years. So this was warp speed, uh, certainly for the, for the WHO. But the WHO cannot do this, uh, cannot do this alone. Um, this pool is, is, is more complex than the medicines patent pool for various reasons, uh, in particular because it, it also targets biologics and vaccines. It needs to ensure the IP, the data, knowledge, know-how, technology, the deep technology transfer um, it, it is available for, for others to use. Now, I think we lost you there. No, I'm I'm back. You're back. Hi. I'm back. I'm back. I have um, we we have I, I have bandwidth issues. Maybe I talk too fast. Um, no, the we the reason, of course, of the, the way to um, uh, to to get the 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 CTAP working is through those billions that are currently being spent on. The research and um, and development. When you spend that kind of money, you should make demands, and this is not happening. And here, I would like to focus on what's happening in 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 Europe for um, for a little bit. There are strong resolutions from the European Parliament asking the Commission to do exactly that. Also, asking the Commission to increase transparency. None of that is happening at the moment. What has happened, and that is encouraging, the Commission has published a manifesto on EU COVID-19 research and development, where it asks the recipients of its R&D funding to make results accessible without delay um, and to share existing to share IP uh, on existing platforms, for example, through a medicines patent pool, it asks its recipients to publish uh, open access, make sure that research data is available, and grant for a limited time non-exclusive royalty-free licenses on the intellectual property resulting from the EU-funded research. This is directly in, in relation to the COVID-19 funding that the European Commission is supporting. These are very good demands, but it is entirely unclear 
why the Commission does not write these demands into the funding contracts with corporations and institutions that get that money. Now you may say, well, do you know, perhaps they do write them into the contracts. You may have a point because those contracts are, are not publicly available, but uh, we have a very strong suspicion that that is today uh, not, uh, not happening. Which brings me to the, the next issue I wanted to, to raise, and that is the, the transparency. Transparency is extremely important, particularly in relation to the development of, um, of, of the vaccine, but also because of the principle of the public financing being spent on this. The public accountability is absolutely, is absolutely crucial. This morning there was a hearing at the European Parliament where transparency was really a core theme, very, very strong statements by members of Parliament and demands on the Commission to increase the, the transparency. Um, the, the discussion is also going on in my country, my home country, the Netherlands, where this morning a newspaper reported that the reason why the government can't disclose the details of the purchase commitments that it has made is because the European Commission had demanded um, the countries to, uh, to, not, uh, to not do that. Now, as I said, things will, may change because there, there seems to be a bit of a political backlash um, against the, 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 the secrecy surrounding these, uh, these deals, which is, of course, uh, particularly fed because the money that is being spent is our, our, public, uh, our public resources. Uh, now, to, to conclude, the WHO CTAP um, needs to be supported by member states. Of course, CTAP will engage with corporations and with others that hold IP, but those that can actually make this happen can, can actually um, fill the, 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 the COVID-19 technology access pool are those that spend the money on the research and development. It's true what Jamie said, the medicines patent pool dealt directly with the corporations, but if the medicines patent pool had been established at the time the research and development into the antiretroviral drugs took place, um, that would have, the pool would have been established 20 years ago and it would have been dealing with the funders of the R&D uh, that, that led to the development of these, of these antiretroviral drugs. And with that, I've spoken for 30 seconds too long, but that was my, my blackout. So over to you, Tim. Thank you, Ellen, as always. And no, I don't think you talk too fast. Um, so, panelists, um, how are we going to do this? I think because I, I don't have you all on screen at, at, at once, um, I'm going to look at uh, the list and, and read out a question and then run down and ask for your comments on this. And the first one goes to really the heart of it. It's a question from Politico. How do you respond to the dismissal yesterday by global health officials such as Richard Hatchett saying that IP isn't standing in the way of access to vaccine? Hatchett said that breaking down IP protections could in fact inhibit innovation. So, Marianne Jella, do you have a comment on that? Of course I have a comment on that, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a. Uh, it, I, I know what I'm gonna say is controversial, you know. But um, I've, I've reached a stage in my professional life and also in my life where uh, I'm looking for some very pragmatic approaches to to deal with current problems. Right. So uh, we don't have an easy solution to patents to the vaccine access in the next two years. Right. And we expect that next year. Here the main, and I can say this, I'm not, I'm just repeating what I said before, and I, I, and I cited yesterday, something from political, was a, I, I cited the CITAP as, a, as, a, as something that we, we are doing differently. But for the short term that we are talking, 20, in 21 and 22, we are talking about a period where you have scarcity of products, and where the, the issue right now, which, which is in everybody's mind, is how do you get access to it next year, right? next year. And then I agree with, with Richard in the sense that next year, it's the patent is not, not the main barrier. It's not the main barrier. It's the manufacturing capacity. It's getting a product that's both safe and has a minimum efficacy, because that's the other issue. You, you may get shit coming into the market. 
products that don't fit up the Joe's target product profile, right? And right now, uh, the big effort that WHO is doing with the partners and SEP is included on that and, and Gavi is to, to work on the pooling mechanisms. That's the COVAX facility that right now has 156 countries engaged plus 38 who are still finalizing the contract. I know this is not about the facility. We're not discussing this, but I'm saying this, that this for the phase one, which is next year, probably beginning of, of 2021, the huge challenge that we have is to ensure that countries, low and middle income countries, receive vaccines on a timely manner uh, with high income countries. That's my goal right now. WHO has developed an alloca a fair allocation framework that's going to have uh, a bit of therapeutics as well, but it's developed a, a fair allocation mechanism that will, is working with Gavi and CEPI to ensure that this drug these vaccines, when they come into the market after phase three, everything completed, and it's probably we are seeing this uh, likely to happen mid next year, that we don't have a, a huge gap in time of availability at country, uh, low and middle income countries like we had with H1N1 in 2009. You know, so that's, I'm being very quiet. And the other thing that I think this audience also needs, we need to think of uh, how we're going to deal with the IP issues on the biologicals, right? And that's, that includes the biotherapeutics, not only the vaccines. I think I'm, I'm more worried right now about a biotherapeutic being a, a, a proved to be safe and effective for our, to, to save lives in the case of severe disease or mild disease, whatever. No, and those are going to come, there are IP barriers that are super important, they are scaling up barriers that are super important, and they are, uh, will be coming to the market without us being able to control as much as we are able to control the procurement and the pooling risk mechanism through the COVAX facility. So that's my <laughs> response, if I took too long. Tim, Tim could, I, could I respond to? Uh, yeah, to your, Jamie, uh, and Ellen. Um, I, I think the idea that somehow uh, IP is a, or know-how, access to sharing of IP and know-how is not an issue is, is wrong. Uh, particularly for, in this particular area, uh, first, you know, there, there is litigation, some litigation going on between people with competing uh, cl claims on patents, but more generally, what you, ha you have a situation where you have a historically large role of governments in funding the research and development. They're throwing around money and anyone that has any promising technology, and, and in some cases, well over a billion dollars a company. So you've got governments build, uh, paying for the building of factories, uh, the preclinical research, the clinical research, paying for the trials, guaranteeing to buy the products if they pass the muster. They have advanced purchase contracts out there. They have everything. So much money is flying around. The idea that somehow there's not a, that, you know, there, that they need some kind of a, a uh, special incentive to invest. They don't even have to invest their own money. In a lot of cases, they're just spending the government's money. That's the first thing. And secondly, the market's the biggest vaccine market there's ever been. It's not like uh, you're talking about some neglected diseases. This is something that affects the whole world. And so it's a massive thing and nobody can do it. it, it the COVAX thing, you're talking about initial allocation of only 3% of the people that need the products. It's tiny. Now you've got about five different vaccine platforms, I think, in the technology transfer issues are really different for each of them. I think Paul in his comments on the, on the chat has said that uh, uh, the issues about know-how are, are really important. In, in the following sense, patents in an individual country are pretty easy to overcome in theory. Germany has a law that allows them to override patents right away for this area, for example. Most countries can do the same thing. That's helpful, and, uh, but I think people understand that for vaccines and, and biologics that the know-how will be like the critical issue. But they're doing that right now. I mean, they are sharing the know-how among the CEPI kind of cartel uh, members right now. That's already happening. So they, it can be done. What there has to be is forced technology transfer. You have to force people to provide the effective thing. Now that happens in merger cases sometimes in the United States. It's happening voluntarily within the CEPI framework. It isn't happening here. Uh, uh, and the other thing is if, 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 if the IP and the, and, and the know-how somehow can't be transferred, why do they even need IP? 
I mean, if it's, if it's really the case that no one could compete with them, if, 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 even if you gave them the rights of the, of the patent, what do they need patents for in the first place? Clearly, they can't supply the market. It, the, the, the capacity is just not there. Uh, and and uh, the, the people that are funding the R&D have eliminated the whole argument that somehow you have to have strong IP to induce investment. There's never been so much money thrown at vaccine manufacturers as there is right now, and it's going to be a massive market. Thank you, Jamie. Ellen? Yeah, just a couple of additional comments. Um, I, I think we hear that quite a bit. Patents are really not the issue. Perhaps what people mean to say is it's not just patents that you need to transfer. You need to transfer know-how and knowledge and technology, and there needs to be direct assistance. There will also be, uh, there's also a need for, for, for an investment in production capacity the globe over, because as Jamie said, no one has the capacity to, to produce at the scale that, that, is, that is necessary. So perhaps um, uh, that is what, what is meant uh, at this very moment, those that, um, that hold IP and knowledge uh, necessary to produce vaccines. Uh, look at AstraZeneca, who obtained that from Oxford University or the Jenner Institute, rather. Um, they, they are taking the approach of transferring that to other um, production facilities in various developing countries. And that includes uh, licensing of the IP together with, with, with many other things. So to say that this plays another role in ensuring ensuring that the scale of production over time will be um, uh, will, will take place is is do, does not make a great deal of sense that is not the same as to say that you shouldn't also focus on making sure that what becomes hopefully available fairly soon without all of these mechanisms fully you know, fully in place and fully operational that you shouldn't focus on the deals that are being made uh, made today but that is that does not justify saying that patents don't play a role. Uh, can I make a theme? Please, Lewis, please go ahead. Yes, uh, you, you, just as a small comment. First, I, I think that the, the issue, of course, is not only patent, it's the issue of exclusivity related to a patent and secrecy related to the process needed to obtain a patent. Uh, so, so we, we see in the news that some country accused other country of stealing the knowledge of their vaccine and they are hacking to get so so it shows that uh, the pharmaceutical companies and researchers are working at in secrecy and, and therefore they are doing that to guarantee their exclusivity in the future so so we have uh, even for vaccine not only for therapeutic the problem of patent be, being a wrong incentive uh, that, that it precludes collaboration uh, that will speed the process. So it, the, the IP, even for vaccines today, has shown to, to, to be a barrier. Thank you, Lewis. Um, Anna, I can't, I can't see you on screen, but did you want to jump in here or should we move to a different question? I just wanted to add, thank you, Tim, um, just one point that I, um, yeah, I, that, I mean, I, I echo um, what Jamie and Ellen and others have said already in response to that, um, the, the, this common argument that, that we're being presented that IP is not an issue. I also want to kind of point out that I don't think we should be making this distinction between the acute phase and the longer term um, um, need that the world will have. And we don't know what that longer term need is, but there could, there could well be a need for an annual dose of this vaccine or future, um, we may need future supply going on indefinitely. So the, the idea that we don't act now and early to, sh to share the, the IP, the know-how, the technology to ensure that we can scale up and we're ready to scale up now for that future, that makes no sense to me um, at all. Um, and, and, I, and yeah, I have a pro and I have a concern as well that this language is, is also um, being used within the context of the COVAX facility that that if we um, secure enough supply for three percent, twenty percent, what after that 
is it going to be left to market forces to to cover the rest of the population and what mess will we be left with if that is the case so i i don't see any justification for delaying um acting on these issues um right away thank you uh can, can, can yeah, i just no. add, add that the, the pandemic is i'm sorry but just the pandemic is um is uh is showing that if you have capacity to manufacture that that's really related to whether or not you're going to get access as well and right now manufacturing capacity for some of the vaccine platforms is 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 not very widely distributed so as part of the response there should be an effort to to build up national capacity as anna said not not just for this you, you know for, for, for for this one, but also for other pandemics that might come down the road. This has to be a learning point where we, we, we have to avoid the situation where you have all the secrecy about manufacturing capacity for vaccines. And as Louis said, it's really shocking that you hear people complaining about people having to steal technology as to how to make a vaccine to treat people for COVID when clearly there's uh, an, an inadequate capacity to provide everyone that needs it. Any other members of the panel on that question? Nope. So um, I'm going to crunch two together here. One is from Patrick, um, Patrick Durish. Has anything been shared or envisaged to be shared discussions going on via CTAP mechanism since its official launch? And then conflict of interest declared. Jauma just commented that is there a way that uh, there's any coordination envisaged between CTAP and COVAX, for example? Mariangela? Hey there. Uh, the, the first question was on the, on the sharing of documents. What we are planning is to have uh, first this, this briefing uh, this, this conversation with member states who founded uh, the CTAP by the end of o October. And we will be the, organizing a consultation on the private sector engagement with civil society. But we are happy to share the concept note that's being finalized. As soon as it's finalized, we'll put it on the website. And the second question, I'm sorry, I'm just mindful also of time because I need to live in six minutes. What yes, yes me too. Um, uh, it's, it's regarding um, linkages and coordination between CTAP and COVAX. Oh. Yeah, that, that's a, a good question and it's not an easy answer, right? Because I, at the same time that I, I saw the, during this, I heard during this conversation today, this panel, that there's a lot of uh, and misconceptions around of the money that's coming into Act A, you know, because there is a huge funding gap in Act A. So it is not billions of money being poured. I, I think so far we have maybe 2.7 billion, right? And an estimated need of 35 billion, being that the 12, at least 15 billion for the next uh, six months. So that there's not a lot of money floating around. Okay, that, that's one one of, of, of the, the issues that are, I think it needs to be clarified. So that uh, there's a lot of, the, even the, the EC event, the pledging event that uh, Ellen referred to in the, in the beginning of this conversation, actually a lot of that money that was uh, advertised was ODA money, it was already committed. So it was new money coming in. On the, the linkages, they are partners and, and this is, partially due to the, for example, the, uh, uh, today we had this discussion at the steering group, uh, uh, the nature of the open licensing, global licensing, global licensing has been, has created a, a, some, let's say, uh, not a friendly environment among some of the partners on Act A. So we are working together and Paul Feldner is on this call Today, we are working together with some consultants to help us address it, a lot of mistrust that there is among private sector around CTAP and how do we move this forward on a, on a, on a more method, my methodic, systematic manner so that when we get to the end of this pandemic, we actually have 
address the acute issues, the acute needs that need to solutions right now, and have laid the foundations in and at several of the, the top the issues that were mentioned today, I, I fully agree. You now laying the foundations for us to be able to get to the end of this problem with a with the mid and long term tech transfer and IP issues related to specific uh, products sorted out for for the world to get out of this on a better manner than we are right now. We we are getting into this pandemic on a very difficult context. We need solutions short term and we will need to set up the foundation for the solutions in the long term. And I think that's where CITAP can play a, a great role. And um, I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, on that same question, does uh, any of the panel have any advice on that, on, on that, that second part around integration between CTAP and COVAX? I don't hear so. Okay. Um, I, I have a question, and this is my own question, because I was, was very interested in what you said, Ellen, um, about setting up the medicine patent pool took 10 years and this happened very quickly do you think the 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 difficult birth that we're now having is sort of post hoc and we we can expect this and what experience could you you add to that mix that might accelerate the uptake well i think one of one of the um important advantages of today is that the medicines patent pool is there and that it can already and, and is ready to play a role in the licensing of, of, of IP and technologies that are, that are needed within the context of COVID-19 and that goes beyond uh, the vaccines. They're, they're more likely to, to focus on the, on the, on the, on the therapeutics uh, um, uh, at, this, at, at this stage. So that, that is important. The other important issue that will drive this is the need to build and enlarge the production capacity. Um, because if you, and that requires investments in time and in money, but it also requires the assurances that once you have made those investments, that the access to the IP and the knowledge and the data will indeed be there. As I said, some of the companies such as, well, one company at least, as far as, as we know, AstraZeneca is, um, is sort of following that uh, that model it is doing it um, uh, with, with, within its within its own within its own plans but that should actually be a collective uh, uh, undertaking and I'm a bit amused by the arguments that I hear about IP from the various sectors that that now seem to say it's it really doesn't play a role and you really don't need patents and there it, it is it's it's very much um, a, a deja vu those of us on the on this call that have worked on access to, to HIV medicines will, um, will recognize many of the, uh, of, of the arguments that are being used, uh, sort of recycled again in this, uh, in this context. Um, there is, it is not just about patents, it's not just about IP, but it needs to be part of the solutions that are being built because a lot of those solutions will not work without it. Thank you, Alan. Um, so the, the bell here has told seven. Um, I think, Mariangela, did you leave already? I think so. No, I'm, I'm still here. Oh, you're but still there. I, I need to leave. <laughs> I need to leave him. No, I'm sorry. You do need to go. Well, um, let me just say very quickly that there were some very good ideas today, and I was very happy to hear that. Thank you taking the time, thank you. Um, to the other panelists, we just have one more question. I've been told we can just run over for by five, 10 minutes. Um, it's, it's when the CTAP and Solidarity Call of Action was launched, the lack of support from high income countries and partners in the ACTA was disappointing. I'd like to ask whether or not engagement with member states on CTAP is still possible and what we can do about it. OK, 
Could, could you repeat that? Sure. It's, it's regarding the, the lack of support from high income countries and partners in ACTA was disappointing. And I think we've, we've seen a disappointing response now to, um, to CETA. So what can we as civil society, what can we do to continue to support the idea, maybe support WHO, but maybe also put pressure on, on WHO? Well, I, I, I think if one country early on had sort of gone to the idea of committing on transfer of IP and know-how, like we thought they might have at the time, if France had done it, if the US had done it, the Germans had done it, I think everyone would have followed. Even if the Chinese had done it, it would have put a lot of pressure on people. So I, I think the first mover, I, for the medicines patent pool, it was, it was the fact that Gilead jumped in that, that, that was decisive in that point. And, and if they hadn't done it, probably never would have happened. So, you know, I, 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 because there's like quite a few vaccines on our thing, if, if Italy, was to move or if, if, if Russia or if, if China were to sort of do something, certainly if Biden would, 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 would make the move, that, that would be a big deal. The alternative, uh, the plan B for me would be to sort of resurrect a different model, which is a share and share alike model, where what you do is you create a pool that only works for countries that commit to share their IP. For, for countries without anything to share, it's easy to join. And then, the, you know, the, the, the harder part will be for countries like Germany, UK, United States, China, that, that have, that, ha, that believe they have some kind of, uh, or, or, or France, that believe they have some kind of vaccine capacity in their backyard. But uh, I, think, I think recognizing that CTAP has not been uh, engaged by governments like that is necessary to, as you suggest, Tim, to moving it to the next level. We have to be honest about where things stand right now, and it's, it's not a good situation. Thank you. Helen. I, I, I think it's, it is, it is, 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 is very important to engage with, uh, with governments. And I, I think we also have to recognize that certainly in the early stages of the, of the pandemic, there was a lot of um, sort of nationalism kicking in governments and ministers of health and, and finance, very, very much ministers of economic affairs, very much focused on the national interests. Now we're getting used to the pandemic there may be a bit more bandwidth to also to, 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 to look at this from an international perspective and to reignite the very much needed um, spirit of, of solidarity and, and, and international collaboration that is absolutely essential. And I think in that spirit, um, that, that is the spirit that CTAP is very much needed. I think WIPO as the UN agency for intellectual property can play a role in, in, in supporting this and in, in helping with various discussions that will need to, that will need to take, uh, take place. Of course, the WHO is the lead agency, but the WIPO, of course, uh, should also adopt a public health perspective towards these issues and, um, and, and contribute to these uh, to these debates, as as can other uh, other, other organisations, but the, the governments will be essential in making that happen. I see Marco Alaman has just switched on his. Hello, Marco. It's great to see you. But perhaps Wipo can say something uh, on, on this point, uh, Tim. Well, uh, Ellen, many thanks. Not not much to say. I saw the letter that just came a few days ago related to set and roll for WIPO and, um, and CTAP that I read with great deal of interest. It will probably goes into the competencies of other colleagues rather than myself, um, uh, because uh, there is a very specific division dealing with the uh, IP policy tracker, but I will follow up to see where, what, what is the status of that request and, and what is the view of uh, the hierarchy on that. I know that so far the, there is no draft reply at least, at least I'm not aware of any. Uh, but let me use, advance my view, that is my personal view, because as I mentioned before, it had not been discussed uh, previously in WIPO. But when you see the, the key elements of the CTAP initiative, you can only applaud what WHO is doing. And, and in my view, they they look into the 
right direction in order to find out global solutions to a global problem. They can not be a more global challenge than the one of, of the pandemic. Now, when you disaggregate the elements, not all of them are, um, strictly speaking, an IP, um, um, an IP policy issue. They all of them have an IP, IP, IP component, but not necessarily an IP policy issue. And that is something different because as Maria Angela says, and I was really glad with her intervention, sometimes we need to be practical. O otherwise, uh, we spend hours of discussion, but we are not able to come up with concrete solutions. And if you take example of, for, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the five key elements and you take one by one, transparency around uh, publication of all clear clinical trial results, for example. Uh, the clinical trial may be or may not be protected by IP, but what really matters is the transparency of any clinical trial developed. So this is, you may get into the IP discussions on whether uh, data protection should be or that exclusivity should be available, and that is a substantive issue. But how to, to fulfill the CTAP goal of the publication as soon as possible of clinical trial out outcome is a different issue and is a different commitment. And those that can commit are different actors. And that is probably one of the issues I would recommend in each one of the commitments is good to know who the actors, actors are to be sure what, what you can ask those actors to do. If we go one by one to the next one, for example, promotion of open innovation models and technology transfer, uh, WIPO can help on the discussion of what open innovation means and different ways for technology transfer. But at the end of the day, CITAP what need is those conducting research nowadays will be able to proceed in that way. Uh, so I would say um, we can contribute, of course, and myself, I will be more than glad, uh, but probably the key actors in order to achieve the CITAP goals are not necessarily uh, um, in, in our hand. There may be other actors that needs to be uh, involved. And we can, of course, help in one way or another to get those people aware of the different roles. Uh, and I would be personally more than glad to facilitate, for example, in the SCP discussions in each one of those issues and see how those discussions can bring uh, any idea or any solution as many of those that have been discussed today. But I cannot see myself bring in a very concrete action that can change the situation of CTAP today. Tim? Luis. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, great to see you, Marcos. Uh, uh, thank you for, for being in this conversation. Uh, I, I think that the, 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 or the first request to ask WIPO to to track, you know, a CTAP implementation is the minimum of the minimum. And, and we are sure that because of the goodwill of WIPO, that will be accepted. But, but having you here, uh, I think it will be great if, 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 if you, you could give us more uh, possibilities of uh, contribution. I, I think that, for example, uh, in the case of technology transfer, uh, WIPO does regularly technology transfer, you know, training to the universities and countries, and, and, and CTAP is technology transfer. So, so if you include, you know, CTAP in your technology transfer training, or, or you create a special one, it will be uh, awesome. Uh, also, you know, with regard to, to, to data, uh, well, one thing is to publish the data. The other thing is that the, what do you do with the data? And, and, and then that exclusivity and how to go around that exclusivity in these cases is a matter of uh, why point. And uh, so we look forward, uh, Marcos, on seeing you coming with, with some great ideas soon. Thank you, uh, Marcos. I'm, I'm convinced that there are too many brilliant minds around here that will be able to bring better ideas of those that I can bring, keeping in mind, uh, not only my limit, but also my role here. But certainly there are a number of issues, Luis, that we can do. And there are a number of issues in which we can help. I will, I, I will internally um, find out what is the status of the request. As I mentioned before, it's not on the, my, my area of responsibility, but let me, let me just share with you something that um, is subject of discussion tomorrow and is somehow related. I mean, the discussion on the, on the Paris Convention guidance and how to implement 
actions in the IP offices related in how to deal with the different uh, IP, um, um, IP categories application in front of the different offices. Uh, one of the elements included in the guidance is the need for transparency. That is exactly what CTAP is looking for. And what I am calling is that these transparency measures be added to the role of the WIPO policy tracker. That is exactly what you are doing. So we are in the same line of thought. The only thing is, is not only my responsibility, but I will find out who is in charge and I will see what, in which way I can contribute. Thank you, thank you. So it's my job now to thank the panelists, um, to uh, Mariangela, who's had to leave us, to Anna, Jamie, Lewis, and Ellen. Thank you so much for taking the time out this evening. It actually has run incredibly smoothly, thank to your, thanks to your professionalism and timekeeping. So um, with that, and with uh, Knowledge Ecology International's permission, I'll close the meeting, thank you.